I'm oral historian Mike Chappelle. Today, June 5th, 2011, I'm interviewing Dr. Aldo Pincara for the Endocrine Society at its annual meeting being held this year at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Dr. Pincara, would you please tell me a little bit about your family background, starting with your grandparents? My grandparent was a, a lawyer and has been the mayor of uh, a small city for 20 years, more or less, Casino, which is in the middle uh, between Rome and Naples. But at that time, it was more related to Naples. It was a southern uh, city. Uh, the other grandfather from my mother's side uh, was in the Marine. And so he was a captain and was traveling all around the world. So my family practically has been mostly of a Neapolitan area. And as a matter of fact, I was born in Naples, but the family was divided by being part in Casino, which at that time, as I said, was more in the Neapolitan area rather than Roman area and Naples. Um, the atmosphere in the family was very much Napolitan, but uh, soon after my birth, we moved to Rome. And so I have been spending all my childhood and my university training in Rome, always with the idea that Naples was the real place where we should do and stay. But you know, the education has been in Rome. And after that, uh, I, we moved around, and I think I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, I don't know whether it could be of interest. We were five, and uh, the reason why I finally decided to get into medical school is that in our southern type of family, uh, one had to do one different profession from the other brother. Hmm. Uh, so my first brother was supposed to be a lawyer, and then the second engineer is, was my father, and then what was left, I had to be a physician, which indeed I did. There were two sisters, and one decided to be an architect, which to my father was, wasn't really the thing that he would make the first choice, because engineer like people that, you know, are straightforward architects, a little bit artists. And so the other one has been uh, a teacher, a foreign language teacher. So anyhow, this was the background where and all of us have been very uh, active in our professions in one place or another. What type of education did you have? Well, what I would say is that one of the problem, uh, no, the, the thing that really was uh, uh, considered by my father and my mother important was to have a broad education, uh, which means that uh, we were all trained in humanities very much, but uh, we had to learn languages. So as children, uh, we had to learn German, French, and English. So all the children had had education in this sense. Uh, they also made an effort to make me uh, loving a sport. I was trained as a fencer, but no success. I was also supposed to be musically minded, but I spent years in learning piano, but no success. But that's it. Hmm. I like music. I like it, but I can't play. So then I think always thinking of the importance of uh, uh, foreign languages 
and to increase the spectrum of knowledge and so on. Since uh, we were, let's say, 16 years old, uh, every summer we went to a summer school somewhere, yeah, in France or in Germany or in uh, England. And this again was, you know, to reinforce the knowledge of the foreign languages. So I think I liked it very much. I was more trained in humanities than in science up to the moment when I entered the medical school. Why did you choose the University of Rome for your medical school? Well, uh, in Italy, uh, there is practically the habit to go to the university which is in the city where you live. It's much more less common when compared with the States that one chooses the university which is not where one lives. So for me it was absolutely normal to go to the University of Rome, uh, which after all is a very good university, so it's uh, uh, the, the choice was not difficult. Now, what type of physician were you planning on becoming when you first entered school? Well, I must say, I didn't have a very clear idea. What I knew, knew is that I would not become a surgeon, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, I think a, a clinician, that this was uh, uh, the thing, um, but uh, with a scientific interest. So it's, uh, I started when I went uh, first uh, registered in the medical school. I have been working as a volunteer student, you know, in a very basic science atmosphere uh, and laboratory, uh, but was too basic. And uh, at a certain point, uh, my mentor then there said, look, you're fine, frogs are nice for you and so on, but you probably like more human beings, which is... Uh, and so I moved from uh, this uh, laboratory to a clinical lab. Who was, who was your mentor? Uh, the mentor I had in Rome, the university, was a person called Cassano, Professor Cassano, he was an eminent clinician, an endocrinologist by choice, but a general internist. And he had, you know, he uh, was a person that really felt important to have experience also outside um, Italy. And I, these were, you know, in the 50s. Uh, and it was not so usual uh, to have some of the young associates going around the world. So when I said, what about going to the States? Do it. Mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, you know, nowadays cannot be regarded as something peculiar. But uh, in this time, uh, in the mid-50s or late 50s, it was something, I mean, to go abroad, spend time, and then coming back. What drew you to uh, clinical endocrinology? Was it this mentor, uh, Professor Cassano? Oh, yeah. Professor Cassano was one of the founders of the Italian Society of Endocrinology. And in the, this internal medicine environment, uh, most of the interest was in, uh, in endocrinology. And the thyroid was part of this interest. And there was a second mentor, the name is Baschieri, and he was very much interested in iodine metabolism. And so I got involved in the thyroid uh, with, I would say, a large interest, uh, but not too much focused on uh, uh, research. Then uh, the lab with the thyroid research came with uh, an experience I had with a, um, a, in France in the laboratory of uh, uh, Serge Lisitsky. He has been one of those who really founded 
in France, the thyroid research was in the group that discovered uh, triiodothyronine in the thyroid. Uh, the other big discoverers uh, found it in the blood uh, was Pitt Rivers and uh, Gross that really made most of the work on that. Uh, but in the uh, laboratory of Marseille, where Serge Lysiski was, the atmosphere was fantastic. Now, night and day working on chromatography and making by ourselves all the instruments to work. And so from this point, I think, I had this uh, major interest in the thyroid. The explosion came when uh, I finally got a fellowship, a Fulbright fellowship and the NIH fellowship, and so went, uh, came to the States. And uh, it was at the Mass General. Mm -hmm. And the Massachusetts General Hospital was, you know, and has been always the place which, for me, has been the perfect place where to bind interest in research and clinical activity. So it's, uh, and the thyroid unit in, uh, at the Mass General, which was located in the Bulch, Bullfinch um, building in the uh, basement, was uh, something that, uh, you know, you couldn't even think that could be more active because there was an activity going on. A number of people coming from all over the world. Uh, the people working there, they were fellows from several places and countries of the South America and from Europe, uh, from Japan, from India. And uh, I think that was a melting pot. If I have to say, if I ever found anything like that, I don't think we could find it. There was a leader, a mentor that all of us have regarded as uh, our really father and inspira inspirator, and that is uh, John Stanbury. And with, you know, the point, uh, John, what he really taught us is, do it, do it by yourself. And uh, we had to do it. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, competition in doing, not any. But if I think that over there, uh, part, the group from America, but then uh, Reginald Hall, Jacques Dumont, Christian Becker from Belgium and England, and we had Pretel from Peru, Medeiros from Brazil, Litwak from Chile. And, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, Kanji Turizuka from Japan. And then there was a big association with a big man from India, Rama, Ramalinga Swami, that was a friend of uh, John Stanbury. So I think that over there, one could live the entire atmosphere of people who were uh, exchanging ideas but with a single type of uh, object. Um, one thing which is peculiar in the thyroid is that the research in the thyroid has been very much linked to social applications. Uh, iodine deficiency has been one of the major uh, topics. Uh, and if we think uh, that uh, since that time, in the late, early 60s, uh, now, what has been done in the application of the research in this field, that uh, millions and millions, billions of people have been uh, benefiting from the iodine prophylaxis which came out from this type of research, the prevention of the iodine deficiency disorders 
related to the brain development. Now, this makes you understand that what you do then has a translation into a uh, clinical uh, and human benefit. So this is another thing uh, which was, uh, is related to the thyroid research, always in the same sense, is uh, the application to the early diagnosis uh, of congenital hypothyroidism. Uh, that the early diagnosis uh, makes possible to prevent the damage of the brain development so that the people who have this uh, congenital disorder, the lack of thyroid function, then may grow as a normal person. Again, this is part of the social health um, application. Social but medicine. Social medicine. But from the other point of view, I think that most of the things that uh, many of us have been doing is in to improve uh, the knowledge in terms of uh, pathogenesis, cause of the disease, and the diagnostic procedures and the treatment. Can I, can I ask you what research you were doing in Boston, in, in uh, Mass? Well, at the MDH, when I came in, I had about 20 different projects in my mind. And uh, then uh, John Stanbury, after Senate one, he said, look, first you stay there, remain seated, and think what you really want to do. Then after certain time, he said, did you think? Did you? I said, yes, I did. I now have about eight, ten projects. Look, you select one. That's the thing. So you have to do it. And then I said, look, I want to study the mechanism and the pathogenesis of hyperthyroidism, and so I have to study and, uh, the problem of TSH and uh, TSH stimulation in that disease. Look, I said, well, I'm not so sure that it's TSH, but do that. And if you have, uh, why don't you just get into the problem of uh, the long acting thyroid stimulator, which was a new thing at that time, uh, and saying, look, and, uh, but this, if you have really to learn, you should learn the bioassay, which is unavailable here. Uh, the guy who does it is over there in Montreal. You know, this was 1962. For me, I, was, I came to Boston by ship and to take a plane, you know, so what's that? I said, no, tomorrow there is a plane to Montreal. You go there. And uh, my wife, who accompanied me, said, okay, let's go. And so we went to Montreal. And over there, I learned the essay in the lab of a marvelous guy, Max McKenzie. Mm. So come back. And then somebody said, now you are on your own. You learn it. Do it. <laughs> and so this has been the beginning of a long adventure of a, you know, a love affair with the graves and the graves of tonopathy disease and so on that has been continuing for years. What were the circumstances of your being recruited to Pisa in 1970? Well, the way in... Uh, the, our academic system goes, particularly at that time, uh, was that uh, one would go from one university to another uh, to get to have a facilitation in the career. So I was an assistant professor, and when I was in Rome at the University La Sapienza, uh, then uh, my second mentor got to the chair in Pisa, and I was going to be promoted associate professor. So I moved to uh, Pisa, and uh, I 
they really didn't think that I would stay and remain in Pisa for a very long period of time. But this was exactly what did not happen, because I did go there in 1970, and since then, I have been always in Pisa uh, for decades, I must say. Uh, probably I spend in Pisa a larger part of my life than in any other place, which is, you know, more than 40 years now. And so I became a Pisan, and which, uh, you know, in the Pisan uh, university and the Pisan city, recognized the thing. And so I have been given an award uh, which says, uh, you may be a Pisan by birth, but be, you may also become a Pisan. And so it's in Italian is uh, Pisano si diventa. So I became a Pisan, but I still remain a Napolitan anyhow. <laughs> what were your initial responsibilities at well, I was um, as, as an associate professor, and in our system, this means that I would run practically all the things related to research and so on, and be very busy in the clinical area too. Uh, a side uh, thing uh, um, aspect would be to some extent. Uh, the teaching, the teaching would at that time mainly given by the chair. Mm. Uh, but then things changed. After a certain while, I became a full professor and then I made all my career there. That's uh, uh, chief of the unit and then chief of the department uh, and have been, you know, for a long period of time, the chief of the Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism. And then uh, a dean for the teaching uh, activities. And the whole career has been expanding in the sense that I had a number of other commitments at the national level. And uh, by being the vice president of the National Council of all the professors, not only medicine, but history and whatever is it. Uh, this is because of my interest in making whatever could be done for the reform of the university teaching and activities. But in Pisa, I think that uh, I had the chance to reproduce, to some extent, the thyroid unit of the Massachusetts General Hospital. And so, the effort that uh, uh, we have been able to do in uh, Pisa uh, was to de give an emphasis to translation, translational research. Uh, a lot of laboratory work, but a lot of clinical work. An application from diagnostic and pathogenetic studies uh, to the clinical um, tools for diagnostic procedures and treatment. And I think that this has been a very uh, nice uh, approach to the activities uh, that we could have, because uh, in the, this uh, thyroid unit, endocrine unit, a number of young people uh, were recruited and probably the thing that I am more proud of everything is to have raised a number of very, very good scholars. Uh, now, uh, of the group that uh, we um, have been raising in Pisa, there are eight full professors uh, all over Italy and they established their own group. Uh, so they are in Naples, uh, they are in Pavia, in Siena, in Barese, which is another uh, place, in Sardinia. So they, and they create their own other groups 
all interested in Thailand and something more, because you have to do something more too. <laughs> well, so is, uh, uh, I think that the important thing is that, uh, you know, when I will finally retire completely, <laughs> there will be eight new schools going on. And uh, all of that have, have been very successful, have been publishing and are publishing uh, interesting things and so on. So it's, um, the other point is the interest in the general uh, assess, new assessment if possible of the medical schools and the uh, postgraduate and post, uh, yes, the specialist type of teaching. And uh, it's still a process that goes on uh, to have uh, a specialty uh, teaching more close to the problems and also more close, let's see, the clinical activity, but with a scientific background. And that's uh, uh, the effort that we are making at the present time. Uh, it's very recently, the interest shifted a little bit uh, from the thyroid uh, to parathyroid. Uh, there are friends saying that the parathyroid are important because they're close to the thyroid. But, <laughs> and I, so I have a group working on the calcium and parathyroid metabolism. That's a person named Claudio Marcocci. But uh, the main group remains the thyroid. There is no question that's uh, with uh, very nice uh, people like Fancy, like Pacini, Rossella Elisei, Vitti, and Chiovato, uh, Mariotti, you know, they have uh, something like my, my son and daughters. <laughs> and that's like, and uh, what can I say is that um, they keep on going, but now because of age, I am a emeritus. Uh, you know, with the meritus symbol uh, status, you could do, choose to do many things. One of the things, doing nothing. I pretend <laughs> to be still useful, and so I have my own activity going on. I remain in the department, uh, advising if I can, and doing whatever I can do. What about, can I ask you a little bit about the, the research that you've done through the years? And start, say, with thyroid autoimmunity. Um, oh, yeah. Well, thyroid autoimmunity stems from uh, the fact that if you are working in uh, uh, Graves' disease, and the big discovery of uh, Graves' uh, diseases means that it is an autoimmune disease. Uh, with uh, um, our good friend, Les de Groot, uh, we have been making a tour with Sitting Bar, Nagataki, Pointeros, all over uh, uh, the world with a seminar that we transferred from one city to another, from Bangkok to Kyoto, then so on, Hong Kong and so on. And one of the points was, I was always uh, uh, talking about Graves' disease and so on, and uh, the symbol was 1956. 1956 was the year when thyroid autoimmunity exploded. Uh, Deborah Doniak and Wright made the discovery in the humans of the thyroid, uh, the Hashimoto's disease as a autoimmune disease. Wichepsky and Rose here, they did it experimentally in the animal, and Adams and Purvis uh, 
uh, did uh, the discovery of the long-acting thyroid stimulator in antibody-causing grave disease, all in one year. And in this year came out that the major acquired thyroid diseases were due to autoimmunity. And so if one moves into that, so this was the time when we, every day you could have a new observation under this point of view. So we had to re, uh, reconsider the major diseases of hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and the key of autoimmunity. And this is, has been uh, a golden time where mm, whatever you did and was new in this part of the thing. So this is uh, one of the things. The scrapes of thermopathy, again, is part of the thing, part because it's the application on one of the complications of grave disease, which is related to the autoimmune reaction. And in a sense, it could be a predicted thing. When I was a fellow uh, before coming here to the States, I spent one month in Barcelona uh, learning how to produce exophthalmos in the goldfish. At that time, nobody really thought that uh, uh, the eye uh, protrusion could come from an autoimmune reaction. But it was known that you could reproduce this in the goldfish. Mm. So since then, there has been an evolution in my interest. And so grapes of thermopathy has been one of the uh, things that have been stunning. Uh, but I would say that if one looks for the hyperthyroidism in the autoimmune uh, spectrum, then one sees that the, a very frequent type of hyperthyroidism is not related to the immunity, and that's the toxic neuroagoida. And by being in an area uh, which is iodine deficient, or most more iodine deficiency years ago, Italy, then over there you have a very frequent form of hyperthyroidism that's related to the toxic neuroagoida which is not the case here in the States, where in iodine sufficient area is the other form is more prominent. So this has been a thing that we have been studying at the epidemiological and pathogenetic level, the toxic nodular goida. And uh, even in uh, recent years, trying to match the problem in relation between environment, and uh, uh, genetics. You published a, a pioneering study in, in that area. Well, this was, uh, you know, uh, something that came out at the correct time. <laughs> what, was the, what was the impact of that study, would you say? Well, one of the things is uh, it really says that uh, if you have something happening in the environment, then uh, this has an influence uh, that can affect uh, the genetic asset of the people. Um, there are other areas that I think uh, should probably mention, and certainly one of the major areas is uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, because, because uh, you know, it's usually said that thyroid cancer is a rare disease, um, is much less rare than one can think of. And the fortunate thing of thyroid cancer is that in most cases we have the tools for treatment, uh, which, you know, is an important thing, but not always. And uh, so there are a number of specific iron, uh, points that we have been considering, uh, the early diagnosis, and the early diagnosis of uh, one type of uh, uh, thyroid cancer, which is the medullary thyroid cancer, uh, which uh, if uh, treated in the early phases, uh, then uh, uh, is much more amenable to a uh, real cure. Mm. 
And uh, from this point of view, I think that uh, some of the studies that have been doing in the lab really gave or give to the physician the possibility uh, to start doing something at the correct time with the early diagnosis. But you know, this, this is only part of the uh, other aspects, uh, what, genetic. What tools are you talking about for the early diagnosis? Well, you know, uh, there is a marker of this type of tumor, which is calcitonin. And the calcitonin increases when the tumor is there. Uh, one possibility is uh, to detect and to the presence of the medullary thyroid carcinoma is distinct from other types of thyroid cancer by measuring calcitonin before you have the histological uh, assessment. This practically implies that you have to measure calcitonin in a number of cases that do not have medullary thyroid carcinoma. But what we feel is that uh, the number of cases that you can identify among those who have thyroid nodules on non-identified nature is uh, so pace the fact that you do it for also people who do not have the disease. Um, because in terms of uh, uh, result of the treatment, there is no comparison. When you treat the patient at the early phase, then you really have the chance to eradicate the disease. So, you know, this is a controversial thing, I must say, because uh, it's always a problem is, uh, is the cost-benefit. Mm. So uh, we believe that the cost-benefit is in favor of performing uh, this uh, screening for calcitonin in identified people. When you say we, are, do you mean the PISA group or do you mean... Yeah. No, the, it's been, well, this started the PISA group. Uh, you know, now is PISA and Siena group because, uh, as I said, one of the groups moved. Uh, to the, but, this, but then this was confirmed uh, uh, in France and in Germany and also in Italy. I don't think that there is a controversy that is uh, uh, something that you can do. The controversy is uh, how much uh, the, the, the emphasis you have to put in there and how many uh, tests you have to perform so to restrict or unrestrict the population that you are submitting to this uh, screening test. So this is the controversy. Well, you know, so far, I don't think that there has been, probably there will be in the near future, uh, some other tool. But for the time being, I don't think that there is anything better. Would you talk a little bit about thyroid cancer in children and your efforts with the World Health Organization? Well, the interest with the childhood thyroid cancer uh, was related to the fact that by being a not very common type of uh, cancer, and particularly in the childhood age, those who have been having an experience at large in thyroid cancer had to deal also with this specific aspect. But uh, this type of interest exploded at the time of the Chernobyl accident. And uh, the reason is that, uh, as everybody now knows, uh, following the Chernobyl accident, uh, the radiation-induced uh, thyroid cancer in children has been the major problem, health problem, related to this uh, nuclear power uh, accident. Well, um, Williams in the UK and myself uh, have been as presidents of the European Thyroid Association, association um, immediately involved in, this, in the study of this problem. In 91, the first rumors of 
an increased, uh, large increase of childhood thyroid cancer uh, was uh, mm, evident, but nobody really in the scientific world believed that could be possible because of previous experience with other radiation-induced cancer. Uh, we felt uh, that uh, thyroid cancer should be developing several years after, 10 to 20 years after the accident. And this was too precocious. So there was some kind of uncertainty, and I would say not believers. That, uh, uh, we had a meeting in uh, Frankfurt, if I remember, Munich, uh, with many people, and uh, the discussion was, cannot be, be you know, but the two representatives from Belarus were present, and they delivered the talk, and so the first doubts came out. So WHO decided, why don't we go and see whether it's true or not? So the mission of the three of us, with the Babistock, the WHO representative, uh, Dylan Williams and myself went there. And in one single day, I could see more children with thyroid cancer than I had seen for several years in my clinic. And uh, Williams, who is a pathologist, so as many uh, uh, histological preparations he had never seen before. So we decided to uh, give this uh, message publicly. Uh, there through, was through the, the WHO? No, well, this was what we did was to, to uh, send a report to Nature because we felt that this was of a major importance. Uh, so we felt uh, the report we sent of the Minister of uh, Health of Belarus, a very lovely person, Kazakov, and uh, on the other side, we as independent observers, and saying, look, it is true, there is a lot. Of, and then we also say that this should come, there is no doubt, well, from uh, radio iodine released because it was the timing perfect and so on. Mm -hmm. And from them, you know, the thing has been uh, observed and documented by a number of other missions, and there is no doubt that uh, there has been this problem. Then we have been involved in the two aspects. One is seeing which could be the cause of the development of thyroid cancer in these children. And we have been looking at the genetic aspects. And so the cause was seen that there is a uh, derangement of the oncogene, uh, red oncogene, is, uh, is so called PTC, which is a specific type of uh, derangement uh, of uh, the uh, red um, oncogene. And uh, so, since then, a number of other studies have seen uh, that. Uh, this type of uh, mutations could be uh, induced by radiation, um, particularly in the children where the children, uh, where the thyroid is much more sensitive to radiation. Um, but but and this is of major relevance because what it tells is that the, when this happens, then you have made to, to protect mostly the children and the mother uh, because, uh, you know, there is in utero also the potential child. The thyroid will take up radiation if it is after the third month of uh, pregnancy. How, how can you protect them? Uh, well, that's the thing. Huh. Uh, WHO established. Uh, a group since uh, uh, several years, uh, 
uh, in, in order to see whether you could specifically protect the thyroid because uh, the thyroid is specifically exposed to this type of accidents because of the release of radioiodine, which is taken up by the thyroid. So the thing is to block the thyroid. This was known, but the WHO had to establish the timing of the distribution of this large amount of potassium iodide or iodide or iodate. Uh, and uh, so there are guidelines that have been, uh, you say, I would say, um, not annually, but uh, periodically uh, re seen and revisited. Um, and the commission of people, the committee of people uh, involved several uh, experts uh, so from uh, uh, France, Italy, and of course the United States, and and uh, and this was another occasion to see very good friends from the states coming and participating in the discussion, mm -hmm. such as uh, Jack Robbins and so on. That's uh, well. So the, this is now called this uh, uh, maneuver mm, or this tool to protect the thyroid is uh, iodine blocking. Uh, um, it's important that there has been changed the name, iodine thyroid blocking, uh, from the iodine prophylaxis. Uh, iodine prophylaxis is used with minute amount of micrograms of iodine, which is usually added to salt, to protect from iodine deficiency. Whereas the, we, one of the things that the WHO had to establish was uh, to differentiate between this iodine prophylaxis from iodine deficiency from the prophylaxis of the radiation-induced thyroid cancer. And so this is the way. But, but, we recently, with the Fukushima problem, we have to point out one aspect that came out from the Chernobyl studies. What we did see is that uh, if you compare areas in Belarus and Ukraine and Russia that are aware iodine sufficient with those that were at that time iodine deficient, then you could see that there was a major difference in the prevalence of uh, radiation thyroid cancer. In iodine deficient areas, there was three times the number of cancer seen with respect to the iodine sufficient. So this is a major uh, point that uh, has uh, uh, been used to promote correction of iodine deficiency in the case, uh, we hope that there will be not other, other cases, but in the case one has another uh, accident of that type of order of magnitude. So it's um, this type of thing. One of the things that I probably would like uh, to stress is that uh, only a few patients of the 6,000 subjects uh, who developed thyroid cancer uh, died because of the disease. Only 15, 17, no more than that. Well, one of the reasons is that there is a type of cancer that has a lot of um, frequently metastatic disease and so on, but is amenable to treatment. And, uh, and one of the things, and when we compared the uh, outcome of the treatment in uh, Italian and French children who developed spontaneous thyroid cancer in their childhood. With the Belarus, we found no difference in the sense that uh, this type of cancer is susceptible to treatment and the same type of treatment that you use in the sporadic type. Paradoxically, they benefit from the use of radioiodine. 
because uh, destroys uh, uh, the metastatic disease and so on, but that's uh, a curious aspect. You mentioned iodine deficiency and how uh, people suffered more who had more cases who were deficient already. Uh, when did you first become involved with the problem of iodine deficiency? Well, it's, uh, by being in Italy, it's difficult not to be involved with iodine deficiency because uh, uh, several areas of uh, uh, Italian regions are uh, where and some are still iodine deficient. Um, I tell you a story. Um, when uh, in the early 60s uh, we were at the Mass General Thyroid Unit Clinic, there was also a uh, thyroidologist uh, from Austria, Tirol. And he was from uh, Innsbruck. Myself was a Italian, and we were challenged with the uh, patients seen at the thyroid clinic. And first seen a goiter, hmm, we would say, this is a typical non-toxic goiter. Whereas in the state they would say, that's Hashimoto's disease. And turned out to be Hashimoto's. We, at that time, in Austria and in Italy would have seen very rarely Hashimoto's disease, but a large number of patients would have goiter in, well, in Italy, millions because of that. Well, now that the iodine deficiency is going, is slowing down, you know, the very big goiters uh, that we used to see, uh, we don't have any endemic cranianism anymore but we did have it several decades ago. So iodine deficiency is a necessarily part of the things that you would like to study if you are a thyroidologist uh, in Italy. Mm. So I started soon after my thesis. And as a matter of fact, I did have my medical degree thesis related to, to this type of problem. What would you say would be your, how do you feel your major accomplishments in this area would be? Well, when I was young, I was always remembering this, 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 this. Mm. Nowadays, I would say that uh, um, probably the major accomplishment uh, is to have built up a group of people uh, that continue to study and to work very successfully. And this is the thing, and I think that if I really can say that I am proud of that, uh, is that uh, this, this group made possible to have people coming from abroad. Mm -hmm. So one of the major things that I really liked was uh, to have less the group, some rapid of a braver man coming, you know, people of the very high standard mm -hmm. coming and spending some part of the sabbatical. You know. So it's uh, Bernal from Spain and some Meng from Germany. Uh, it's, uh, you know. Uh, Was that when you were, you were regional coordinator for the West Central Europe and International <laughs> Council on control of iodine deficiency disorders? Well, <laughs> As a matter of fact, I still remain that. It's, uh, well, this is the commitment uh, to the social medicine uh, aspects. Uh, and uh, this I I D ICC IDD Council, which was founded several years ago in uh, 85 uh, by Stanbury and Hetzel and others, uh, uh, we first met in Kathmandu, Nepal. Well, this is the important thing is, where did we meet first? We met in the places where iodine deficiency disorders were of major importance. 
and this is certainly Himalaya is one of the areas of the thing. Well, I, in the past, I, what I'm really related to is in the making the info, exchange information and promoting iodine prophylaxis in Europe. So we, what we have is uh, 35 to 40 national representatives, and they all push with their coalitions the iodine prophylaxis in their own countries. And what I must say, and we published that in The Lancet, Europe is still iodine deficiency to some extent, which is unbelievable, but this is the correct thing. Now, do you think, uh, are they doing studies on uh, areas around Fukushima to see if they are iodine deficient? Is that something? Um, I doubt that there could be an area in Japan that is iodine deficient. Uh, <laughs> yeah, over there, the problem might be that there is an iodine excess to some extent, but that's a, um, I know that uh, they have been uh, uh, working very much, uh, very actively. As a matter of fact, uh, Shigenobu Nagataki, who is uh, the thyroid scientist uh, of major importance uh, in uh, Japan, is very active with his former pupil, uh, uh, Yamashita, in uh, making possible to have additional iodine uh, pills mm -hmm. to protect the people who are around the area. In this case, obviously, this uh, blocking I talked about is important. But um, as I understand, things are going, you know, in a situation where we shouldn't be, you know, worried about. Mm -hmm. I don't think that any other place than Japan could be really worried about that for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they are doing, uh, they are very active. I must so you say. think that the seaweed and the, the, the iodine they get in their natural diet would, would offer them some protection? Well, it's, uh, there is no doubt that if they were in the iodine deficient areas of, uh, you know, part of Europe and other parts and so on, would have been a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, as far as I understand, the amount of radioactivity which fell down in a large part of uh, Japan were not really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. certainly not in Tokyo, and certainly not in Kyoto, I think. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Endocrine Society. What's been the nature of your relationship with the Endocrine Society over the years? Well, to me, the first association I have been joining is the American Thyroid Association. And so I don't think that I skipped uh, more than one or two meetings all over these years. And uh, then, you know, the American Thyroid Association uh, brings the people that also go to the endocrine meeting. And uh, so it was part of that thing is to expand. So I don't think uh, uh, that uh, any year has passed since uh, the um, late 60s without being here either for the endocrine or the American or both. Uh, money permitting that, uh, that's uh, <laughs> it's always a problem. <laughs> but um, as a matter of fact, you know, the influence has been important uh, for our associations in Europe. We had the American Thai Association, and uh, in 1965 said, look, many of the people who had been in the States uh, for training, going back to Europe, decided why should we always come here? At that time we used to go to Atlantic City, these sort of things. Mm. Well, let's have our association, so we made the European Thyroid Association. For the Endocrine Society, we have the Endocrine in Europe societies for each of the countries. Mm. Uh, but uh, since a few 
a couple of years ago, uh, it was decided to have the European Endocrine Society. But in spite of that, mm -hmm. I think I like to travel and come to the Endocrine Society here in the States as frequent or perhaps even more frequent than I go to the European Endocrine Society because of tradition. Mm, not that. But, you know, nowadays it becomes a little bit difficult to participate in everything because we have the international meetings, then we have the national meetings. And so when you are, you know, a old guy, you have to choose. But, uh, you know, whenever I come here to the endocrine meeting or the uh, uh, Thyroid Association meetings, I find an enormous amount of friends. Uh, so dinners are always busy. <laughs> okay, thank you.